You've already had a little bit of an introduction to concentration, but today we're going to talk about um, concentration and following up on that and how we um, express concentration in a quantitative way. And we're also going to talk about solubility. So concentration is a measure of how much solute we have per amount of solution. So if you remember, the solute is what we're dissolving, and the solution would be what we get after the solute is dissolved in the solvent. All right, so that's just a little bit of nomenclature that you're going to have to get used to using uh, as we talk about solutions and concentration. Okay, so the concentration basically tells us how much stuff is in there per volume of the solution that we have. Um, so if you had a very dilute solution of cranberry juice, for example, um, you could see that over here, all right, very light in color, and then as it gets more concentrated, it would get darker and darker, okay? Um, you've probably also experienced this um, in terms of juice concentrates. Uh, so orange juice um, is... Not so much anymore, but when I was a kid, everybody made orange juice this way. Um, you get a can of concentrate, and that has all the orange flavor and sugar and all that stuff that you need to make an entire pitcher of orange juice. So if we take a can of the concentrate and we add water to it, then we get orange juice in the end. And there's the same amount of orange and sugar and all of that stuff in both of these. The difference is that the volume over here is four times the volume here, okay? So this, um, what we started with, is more concentrated and this would be more dilute or less concentrated. So now in terms of orange juice, we can talk about what is more or less concentrated, but in chemistry, we like to have a number to associate with a concentration. And the way we do that is talking about how many molecules of a particular substance are in a given volume, okay? Um, and if we were talking about eggs, we would use a unit called the dozen, right? Um, this is how we typically refer to eggs. If we pick up two dozen eggs, we know that that's 24 eggs, all right? If we're talking about shoes, we use a pair. Pair just means two. If we're talking about a ream of paper, that always refers to 500 of something. Um, and then a gross, which is a less common one, um, refers to 144 of something. So in chemistry, our unit of choice, because uh, molecules are so small and to get enough of them for us to actually be able to see them is a huge number of molecules. So talking about a dozen wouldn't make very much sense for us. So we use a quantity called the mole. And the mole is no different than a dozen or a pair or a ream or a gross. It's just a much bigger number. So while a dozen equals 12 things, a mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd things. All right, and it takes a little getting used to to um, understand that, but don't be alarmed. We're not going to do a whole lot of calculations with this number in particular, um, but you do need to understand that a mole is a whole lot of molecules. And so molarity is the way um, we express concentration, or one of the ways, um, and you molarity is equal to the number of moles of solute per liter of solution, and a liter is one measure of volume. So to give you an idea... Uh, soda, like the big bottles, typically are two liter bottles, so um, that gives you an idea of how big of a liter is. Okay, um, so if we want to con think about what this is in terms of actual numbers of molecules, um, so how many moles of sucrose are in 0.5 liters of a two molar solution? Okay, so um, two molar tells us that we have two moles per one liter of solution. All right, so if we have a half a liter, then that would tell us that we have half as many moles as was in one liter, right? So that's going to be equal to one mole of solute, or one mole of sucrose in this case, per half a liter. And we can just do that with a proportion, okay? So how many molecules of sucrose is this? That means that if we have one mole of sucrose, then we have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of sucrose, which is a whole lot of uh, molecules. So if you remember, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd means we have 6 with 23 zeros after it. So that's a huge number. Now let's talk about solubility. Solubility is the ability of a solvent or solute to dissolve in a solvent. So the solubility of sugar would tell us, is sugar able to dissolve in water? Okay, um, and soluble is a term that we use to mean that some of it, some appreciable amount of it will dissolve. Okay, so there's 
a continuum in terms of soluble and insoluble, but generally either something dissolves or it doesn't. Um, and so soluble means that some amount of it does dissolve, and insoluble means that no appreciable amount does dissolve. And a precipitate um, is a word that just means the solid that's in a solution that doesn't dissolve. All right, so why isn't sucrose infinitely soluble in water? So to understand this, we need to talk about how sucrose is interacting with water. And you should remember from the simulation that we did that um, if this is our molecule of sucrose, when we put it in water, um, we have little teeny water molecules that interact with it and um, separate it. So our sugar starts out all connected together like this, and then we put it in water, and the water molecules surround it. But at some point, you're going to run out of water molecules to go around the sucrose molecules, and so they can all dissolve if there's too many relative to how much water. So we know that sugar is very soluble in water, which is sucrose, and um, it easily will dissolve in something like hot tea. But if you add enough of it, um, you're going to end up with sugar sitting at the bottom of your cup. Okay, so solubility is also related to temperature. So as temperature goes up, solubility also goes up. So um, as a, building on the example I just talked about, if we look at hot tea, um, we know that the sugar will dissolve in that much more easily than it does in iced tea. Okay, so if you've ever gotten an iced tea out and tried to stir in sugar um, to your unsweetened iced tea, you have to do a lot of stirring to a glass of iced tea because the temperature is much colder, and so it's not as soluble in the tea as it would be if it was hot. All right, for gases, so gases also can be dissolved in a liquid, um, and the most common example of this is soda. But for gases, the relationship is the opposite. So the higher the temperature is, the lower the solubility is. And so over here, this would be an example of Coke that is poured at a warm temperature, and this would be Coke that is poured at a cold temperature. So at a warm temperature, you get lots more foam because the gas molecules are all trying to escape the solution. And at a cold temperature, you get less foam because the gas molecules are all still dissolved in the soda itself. Okay, And you probably have also experienced this as you taste it. If you taste warm soda, it tastes like it has more bubbles, but that's because they're all coming out of solution and um, interacting with your tongue. Whereas if it's cold, they don't come out of solution as much, they stay inside, and the carbonation doesn't affect you as much. All right, so this wraps up our um, discussion of solubility and concentration, and um, we're going to do some experiments with this in class and look at the relationship with temperature and solubility.